ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नम श्री भवानी शंकराय नम श्री मात्रे नम ओम दक्षिणा सरंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यमा अस्मदाचार्य पर्यंता स्मरिया गुरु परंपरा श्रुति स्मृति पुराणानाम आलय करुणाल नमा भगवत पादम शंकर लोक शंकर शंकर शंकराचार्य केशव बादरायण सूत्र भाष्यकृत वंदे भगवत पुनः पुनः ईश्वरो गुरुरात्मे मूर्ति भेद विभागिने व्योम व्याप्त देहाय दक्षिणा मूर्त नम परिज्ञानाश्रम श्री गुरु शंकर परिज्ञानाश्रम शंकर सद्गुरु केशव वामन कृष्ण पांडुरंग आनंद परिज्ञान गुरु सद्यो जात शंकर सद्गुरु गुरुर्ब्रह्मा गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरव नम ओं सहनावत सह नौभुन सह वीर वह तेजस्वीनावधी तमस्तु मा विदिशा वह ओं शांति 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 Namaste. On behalf of Shri Chitra Purmat, I extend a very warm and a cordial welcome to you all to this live webcast of a presentation on the life journey of the ninth Mathadipati and Guru of Shri Chitra Purmat, Paramapooja Shri Mat Anand Ashram Swami Ji, by Shri Chandavarkar Sai Mam from California, USA. It was but a few years back when one fine morning, Sai Mam suddenly felt a spontaneous upsurge of love and devotion for Parama Pooja Shri Mat Anand Ashram Swami Ji, which took him by surprise. It left a warm and a nourishing bond, which he never lost. Something in his mind prompted him to ask himself how he could express his gratitude for this spontaneous upsurge. and he found his answer in sharing this love and devotion by preparing a presentation on swami ji's life journey chandavarkar sai mam was born and raised in kolkata after finishing his graduation in commerce from kolkata university he joined bangalore university for studies in law and subsequently graduated in law in 1986 he migrated to usa and worked for over 30 years as a hospital compliance auditor for the medicare program of the us federal government from where he retired in december 2019 he now spends his time pursuing his passion for history philosophy and literature he is also a meditation instructor and teaches in person as well as online he and his wife chitra live in thousand oaks california It has been just fifty-eight years since Paramapooja Shri Mat Anand Ashram Swami Ji shed his mortal coils and merged into the divine. This guru and master led the Chitrapur Samaj on its spiritual journey for more than half a century. With his calm countenance and mild and serene demeanor, through many a turbulent path. today i invite invite chandavarkar sai mam to reminisce this wonderful period of the golden years of bliss through his presentation over to you sai mam thank you very much for that nice introduction chaitanya mam uh, i'm going to share my screen now and begin the present so welcome everybody to today's presentation on stories from the life of anandashram swami ji and before i actually start sharing the stories i want to dwell for a few moments on the significance of hearing stories from his life after that we'll get to the stories itself and his immense contribution 
uh, to the Guru Parampara. But that, of course, is just the beginning point because then we want to know as the Bhana Pleiadi, what was the secret of his success? What can we learn from his example and bring that to our lives, our individual everyday lives? Finally, I want to dwell on the road ahead. So we'll get to that, but let me first start with the significance of story from the lives of all holy people. There are three reasons why we are sharing this today. One is it's an opportunity to honor the memory of Anandashim Swami, who played such a critical role in keeping the Bhana community together and united in very difficult times. But there's another reason. And the reason is that when you listen to stories from the lives of holy people who are like spiritual engines, dynamos, when you listen to events and anecdotes from their life, that listening itself is a spiritual practice. And finally, when they are in our hearts because of the stories that we listen to, we can learn from their example how to live our life with greater wisdom, greater peace, and some of the grace that they show in their lives. But I also have a personal reason, which I wanted to get to. And Chaitanya Mahama in his introduction mentioned this briefly. I have had love and devotion for Anandashim Swamiji for decades now. And I would like in today's sharing or today's presentation, I would like to lamp, light the lamp of love in your hearts so that when we all walk away from today's presentation, not just stories that you will remember, it will be Anandashim Swamiji's presence in your heart and your love for the Guru and your love for the Mark. That would uplift us all and give strength to our steps. In the Yoga Sutra, in the first chapter, there are a number of sutras that give us options on how to bring calmness to our lives, how to concentrate better. The one, the sutra just before this one, talks about focusing on the inner light within all of us. But it doesn't leave it at that because it, it recognizes that everybody is different. And then Sutra 37 says that one more option of bringing concentration and calmness is meditate on the heart of an element soul. And what better way of meditating on the heart of an element soul is there than to listen to stories from their life. Before we begin and actually get to the stories, I want to do a brief meditation so that all of us can focus and center ourselves and prepare ourselves to listen to the story. So wherever you are, please sit erect. Make sure that you're stable and comfortable so that you can be still for a few moments with no physical movement. Gaze briefly at his image that you see on the screen. Now take that sense of his presence, your heart. That presence fills us peace and calmness. It attunes us to the grace of the Guru Parampara. That grace pervades our entire body. Our hearts are purified and we are cleansed by them. Om Shanti 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 So in listening to the stories, I want to start with the background. Before Andashya Swamiji became 
the book. At that point, the product community was really divided. And there were many reasons for that. One reason was Bombay was coming up as a magnet for uh, Bhanaps to get jobs. So they began a migration from the Canaras to the city of Bombay. That brought in some physical distance between the Canaras and Bombay. And as we all know, physical distance does strain bonds between people and institutions or people and the, and the people that are in their life. There was another factor in that in order to further their career chances or, or for success, many Bhanaps felt it was necessary to go to England for higher education and then come back and work. That too was a matter of physical distance, even more than being in Bombay, being in England was on the other side of the world. Now, these two factors were of physical distance, and physical distance weakens the bonds, as we just mentioned. Uh, but there was one more factor, and, and that was more subtle. Um, it was the fact that monotheistic Hindu reform faiths were beginning to grow in influence in all the major cities of India in those days. And many of the urban manaps came under the influence of this ideology. So all these reasons were take with the drift of the community was to move away from loyalty to the mud. It wasn't the entire community, it was part of it. That was what brought the division. All this pained Andrangashim Swamiji very much. He was deeply pained by it. And he refused to he he declined to take a sisha to continue the Guru Parampara. In May of 1915, his illness took a turn for the worse. As you can see in the photograph itself, the difference in his physical condition between the first photograph and the second makes it obvious that he was not doing well at all. Meanwhile, the elders were praying to God that his that Pandragashan Swami may change his mind. And that he may take a sishya so that the Guru Parampara could continue. And uh, the, all of us would have access to the same spiritual guidance. But that didn't happen, but their prayers continued. And then everything changed on a morning. It was at 2 o'clock in the morning. Pandrugashim Swamiji had fever. He was frail. He was old. Um, and he had a vision. The vision was of a sannyasi telling him to adopt a sishya. He got up, not completely, but partially. And he told the attendants who were there in his room, don't you see we have a visitor here? Why don't you take care of him? Bring some milk, give him a seat, let him be there. Let us take care of him. The attendants, because he had fever, thought he wasn't well and he needed to rest. And so they were pleading to Pandragashim Swamiji to please rest because he wasn't well. So he did rest when they were pleading with him. But only for another two hours. At four o'clock that morning, he woke up again. And this time it was a complete waking up. He told the attendants, call the senior priests to his room because we have to make preparations for Shishya Svikar, which came like a bombshell to the people listening uh, at that point. Senior priest arrived. He asked one of the senior priests who happened to be uh, Mangesh Bhatbam, uh, can one of his sons be taken as the Shishya? And Mangesh Bhatbam line. That changed everything in, in the space of a second. Pandragashan Swamiji's tone changed. It was no longer a request now when he addressed Haridas Ramchandrama, who was the father of Andashan Swamiji in his Purvashram, saying it was now a command. I want your son Shantamurti as the Sishya. And of course, it went through three stages of acceptance. First, the parents, 
first the father, then the mother, and finally of the young Shantamurti, who was only 13 years old in 1915. But things went through, all the, all the stages were fulfilled, it moved forward, and it was decided that this would now be formal and Sishi Srikar would take place. But Pandurgashan Swami, he was hastening this entire process. He wanted it to take place very quickly. That itself created a problem. Because one of the important um, rituals in the, in the transfer or the acceptance of a Sishya is the, the giving to the Sishya by the Guru, which is the staff. And it's not just any stuff. It has to be prepared from a special kind of a wood. There are worship rituals that go in. The whole point in those rituals is that physical staff or the danda becomes infused with the power of the guru and it stays with the sisha throughout his life as a symbol of the guru's blessings. In this photograph, you see here the same danda that was given to Andashtam Swami when he was taken on as a sisha. It stays with the, with, the, with the Swami forever. But the problem was this. It takes time to have that best and infused dand. It doesn't happen overnight. So where was the mert going to get this dand from? If you don't have it, it's one of the most important rituals in the taking of a sisha. What are we going to do? So everyone in the mert was worried. At that point, Pandragashan Swami, uh, Swamiji suddenly remembered that when he was ordained as the Sishya, there were two dandas that were prepared and had gone through the entire process of the Guru's blessings being infused in the danda. One, of course, was given to Pandragashan Swami himself as the new incoming Sishya, but the other was stored in the mud. But now, with just one or two days, how are you going to find that? And so the the the, uh, the mud staff were anxiously looking up at the ceiling to see where can they find in the ceiling this blessed dand. And then suddenly, there was a second miracle. From all the objects that were stored at the ceiling level, the dand that was blessed that many years ago when Pranakashwam Sikh was taken on as the Sisha was attached to the ceiling by a, a twine or a slender rope. While they were looking up, that rope snapped and it fell into the hands, literally fell into the hands of the Merc staff who were waiting, looking up to see where they could identify this country. Now, that miraculously solved the one obstacle, the second obstacle that had come in. And from that point, things started moving forward very fast at blinding. So Nyasa Diksha was given. This Shishvikar took place. And then nine days later, Pandrakashin Swamiji took Mahasamadhi. It was all a disorienting speed of events. Here you see the young Anandashim Swamiji at 13 years old. Guru and Sishya together for a very brief period of nine days. And then on June 14th, 1915 was the day when Pandrakashan Swami took Mahasamadhi. At that point, the nine-day-old Sishya Swami gave Tirtha and holy Bhagirati water to his Guru. And then became the Matadika. So in 1915 to 1927, which is a period of 12 years, was a very quiet period in Andashin Swamiji's life. He was very young, he was 13, and he had this bereavement of losing his guru in less than two weeks. So it was a point for him to focus on his studies, on growing in the spiritual life, and he was very lucky to meet a spiritual mentor, Krishnasham Saraswati Ji, from Rishikesh, who happened to be passing through Shirali at that point and agreed to be Andashim Swamiji's tutor. So 
there was much study that was going on. There was much focusing um, on, on learning. At that point, there were challenges that came his way as part of Murta administration. But it didn't affect the unfolding of his love. Gradually, but surely, his love and drawing people towards the mud started unfolding, even in those quiet years. But 12 years later, there was a quantum leap forward. There was a historic visit that Anand Swamiji made to Bombay in January of 1927. That is a kind of a watershed because then it divides the periods. The quiet period ends and it suddenly changes to something else. So in January of that year, Andashan Samiji came to Bombay. And he was in Bombay only for three days. Just three brief days. But in those three days, all the barriers between the Mathadipati and the laity were broken. It was like a flood. The community gathered around the Guru and all that love that had been held back in some way now came out in the open very rapidly. Three days later, Andashim Swamiji took the train with his retinue to move to, to go to North India. Um, he was to go to New Delhi stay there for a few days and then move on to Rishikesh. So the train was to take him to New Delhi and a lot of Anats came to the railway uh, station to see him off. And it was a very moving situation. The Kendra Saraswat wrote an editorial about that event that when Swamiji turned, when Andashin Swamiji turned to get onto the train, there was not one single heart that did not want him to stay longer with them. Now, I, I bring that up to show that in three days, there was this complete turnaround in love and devotion. Um, and now it was so obvious. When Anandashim Swamiji got to New Delhi, he stayed with Patangi Shankarma. And as as, as they got into conversation, he did mention that the Mert was not doing well, that its financial prospects uh, were difficult. And he just laid out the situation just the, the way it was. But Hadragri Shankarman's heart was deeply touched. Deeply touched. Immediately he felt that his role in life at this point was to jump in and do whatever he can for the mud. That was 1927. 32 years go by. But they were great years. You see some of the statistics here, you know, like Bantika collections more than doubled five years later. Sabhas were being formed in a large number of places, not just Bombay, outside of Bombay. In Bangalore, in the early 50s, which happened, it was actually 1951, the Bangalore Mert was purchased by all the devotees getting together to, to, uh, to, to create the Mert. I mean, the physical, the physical Mert. So as the decades go by, you can see the love and devotion of the laity was getting stronger and stronger. The pinnacle was in 1959. Uh, when Anandashram Swamiji decided to adopt Sisha to continue the Guru Parampara. It was a pinnacle because it was a sign of unity in the community and the Guru's faith in the future. In 1954, which is four or five years before the Sisha Svikar, um, I, I put in this photograph because it shows you the growing love of the community. He came to Bangalore. Uh, a corporate housing society had been just set up uh, and he was uh, invited to inaugurate it. It was named after him as the Anandashram Housing Society. 
Uh, and this was the welcoming committee that brought him in the, in, in the car uh, and took him there. Five years later, in Bombay, came the Sishi Sweeper. You can see the intensity of the expression on, on the faces of the people surrounding him, packed with devotion to the Guru, walking along with the car on the way to Shivaji Park. And then, Sishi Sweeper, and this is probably the most viewed, the most famous photograph for all Manavs of in our history of the Guru Parampara. The acceptance of Parigya Nashan Swami as, as the incoming Shish. I want to dwell now for um, now that you all, all these stories have come up. What made this immense success, this immense accomplishment in terms of bringing the community together. And when you look at these stories, there are three things that emerge. One was Anandashan Swamiji's holiness. As I mentioned before, when you're a spiritual engine or a spiritual dynamo, that holiness touches people's hearts and changes them, not in a few days, changes them instantly. And that is the miraculous thing about it. But it comes when you have that high level of holiness. The second factor was, and this was something that everybody noticed and documented and wrote about, was the fact that there was an extraordinary degree of peace that was there in him, in his personality. He exuded this, he radiated this peace. Everybody wanted to participate in that because to be in his physical presence itself was calming and brought concentration. And finally, it was a fast changing world. Anandashan Swamiji's wisdom about distilling the essentials from the non-essentials because of his insight into dharma and into spiritual life made it possible for him to modify the ancient faith for a changing world. So these were the three that I, I want to bring up some stories for all the three factors that made it possible for him to be to bring about these changes in the community. And I first want to bring up three stories about His Holiness. Um, and they're all with different kinds of individuals. The first was at Hatangri Gopal Mam, but this was when he Hatangri Gopal Mahan was only five years old at the time, so a young child. The second was with two brothers who were unhappy with the mud and had moved away from the mud and stopped supporting the mud, basically. So there's some degree of discomfort between them and the mud. And finally, with somebody who had no connection with the mud at all, a total stranger, in fact, a German engineer who happened to be working in Telco. So I'll, I'll bring up these events to show that it doesn't seem to matter your stage in life, it doesn't seem to matter whether you're a bhana or a non bhana Andashan Swamiji's holiness was such that it touched people's hearts instantly. So let me start with the one with Patangni Gopalma. So Andashan Swamiji was there at his father's home in New Delhi in January of 1927. And Mam was born, I mean, Patangni Gopalma uh, was born in December, uh, five years before that. So he was maybe five years and a month when Nandashim Swamiji came there. And because his birthday was just four weeks before, or maybe a month before, he was given a new tricycle. <laughs> and uh, his father warned him very seriously, saying, don't you dare go anywhere near where the Guru's room is. Wherever you play, make sure that you stay within a certain, you know, a bounds. I don't want you to knock on his door and disturb him. And of course, you know, Hatangri Shankar Mahan was known to be a very strict and a disciplinarian. So it did strike some fear in the five-year-old boy. He was a five-year-old boy. So he couldn't restrain himself. Took the tricycle, went to where he was not supposed to be, peeped into the room where Andashim Swamiji was, and then was overcome by fear that he would be taken to task by his father. But meanwhile, events unfolded rapidly. And he was drawn into it. Andashan Swamiji came, opened the door. He led him inside. 
He even picked up an apple that was next to his bedside and gave it to him. And the five-year-old boy said, can, you, can I share the apple with you? Uh, then he picked him up. He picked him up. He sat him down on his lap and embraced Patangri Gopal Mam, who was only you know, a five-year-old kid at the time. But something happened in that moment. It was a, a huge beam of love that came out from Ananda Shri Swami. He entered his heart. And it, as he wrote in an article in the, in the birth centenary issue, it kindled in Hatayani Gopal Mahar from that young and tender age of five, an everlasting bond of devotion. He never lost it. And as you know, he has done, um, he has written seminal works um, that are now part of our community resources. We can always go back to them. The second anecdote I want to talk about was about what is now known as the Tambat Brothers incident. It's there in 50 years of bliss. And essentially what, what happened in this was uh, because of some families had moved away from, from the mart, the Tambat family was one of those families. Uh, but they were still part of the, um, um, the faith. And so Keshav Mam, who is uh, one of the brothers, was a keen student uh, of Bhagavad Gita. And somehow things worked where the two brothers, Keshav Mam and his, I think the younger brother, who were um, granted an interview with Andashan Swamiji in the Bangalore, uh, in, in Bangalore. There wasn't a mud at that point. Um, and they, they got into a discussion and Keshav Mam brought up, the, because of his study of the Gita, he brought up various questions. Does the Gita really apply to modern contemporary India, to modern life? Um, and there was a discussion on some of the um, locusts in, in the Gita. But something happened, like happened in, in, some, in the previous incident that I talked about. It wasn't just the discussion of a few things in the Gita, or what is the meaning of this, or what is the, the significance of this. That, of course, was there. But in that one hour or an hour and a half of, an, of, of a direct encounter with Andashan Swami, their hearts were purified and cleansed right away. And there was great love that sprang up in them for the Guru and for the Mart. A few weeks later, um, there was a large conference of Banaps to talk about Mart affairs. And many, they were all assembled uh, where they were gathering. And the two brothers came in. And they were known in the community as being uncomfortable with the Mart. The two brothers came, prostrated themselves in front of the assembled Bhanaps there, um, beg forgiveness and vowed to stay as strong supporters of the Mart. It came to everybody as a revelation because it was completely unexpected. This was not on the cards at all that somebody's heart would change completely and would go from being uncomfortable to being a very strong, committed devotee. The third story I have for you is with uh, Anandha Shri Swamiji's uh, interaction with Dr. Kursh, who happened to be the general manager of Telco at the time. Um, uh, and Kulkarni Vasant Mam at that point was a senior official in, in Telco. Um, and uh, he, stayed, he stayed with Kulkarni Vasant Mam. And a uh, a tour was arranged uh, to take Anandashan Swamiji around the works. Initially, Vasant Mam approached the general manager, which is Dr. Korshan, and said, uh, the Swamiji from our communities is here. We would like to show him Telco because it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's one of the prime examples of India moving forward as an industrial nation. Uh, can you take him around? And Dr. Korshan was had a reputation for being somewhat brusque person, you know, uh, brusque and, and uh, he spoke his mind. He, but politeness was not one of his known qualities. So he refused right away. He said, I don't believe in bishops or saints or Swamiji's or anything. I don't want anything to do with it. You can ask somebody else. So Vasantham asked the head of the foundry, Dr. Chakravarti, I think it was, uh, to take Antashir Swamiji around Telco. So that took place. 
And they were in the foundry maybe half an hour later when Dr. Kirsten, uh, uh, Dr. Chakravarti was, was showing him the foundry. And Dr. Kirsten, who was the general manager, happened to be there because it was part of his routine to go through the works on a daily basis. Uh, and he saw this interruption, this showing around that was going on. He walked up to Kulkarni Vasant mom and said, Vasant, I know I refused to take your Swamiji around, Telco, but I've changed my mind. Can I show him around the works? I've never seen a person of such radiance, of such magnetism. And of course, Vasant Palm said definitely, and then it changed. Uh, it, um, uh, Dr. Koshin himself escorted Anandashim Swamiji around Telco Works. And at the end of that tour, he even prostrated before Anandashim Swamiji. Now, that's the third example I have of something that happens not even overnight. It happens because of an encounter. Your heart is changed completely. And why, where there was either indifference or maybe mild hostility, or unconcerned, now there is love and devotion. So I want to stop here for a very brief moment to talk about holiness. And it's hard to talk about holiness because it's a very abstract quality. It's hard to define beauty. But we know it and we see it. We know it from the impact that it has on us. It kindles love in our heart which wasn't there before. It brings devotion, which was not there before, maybe. And it gives us a sense of spiritual well-being. And that too is an abstract word. But we know what it means to be physically well. You have that sense of vigor and lightness in your body. The spiritual well-being has its own feeling that, uh, that we experience. When you experience that, you know you've been touched by holiness. I want to go now to something that Andashim Swamiji was, was very famous for. Um, and this was just the peace that he emanated, came out from him. Those who encountered him uh, absorbed that peace. And it shows up in different ways of dealing with life. One was his ability to discuss difficult issues or those which had a kind of a touch of something potentially uh, confrontational. He would just lay out his position. There was no animus. There was no arguments. There was no opposition and attempt to break down somebody's position. It was just a straight cut presentation of, of, a, of a certain position without any of that heat. And that in itself touched people's hearts. We saw before when, when Anandashim Swamiji was um, at Hatangri Shankar Mahan's place in New Delhi, an example of the difficult issue. There was a difficult issue in that the Chitrapur Mot at that point in time was going through financial difficulty. But it wasn't as though there was any request for help. It wasn't as though he was trying to draw in people to help. It was just a straight cut presentation that there were difficulties and it was a sharing. But it's the kind of sharing that comes with that serenity and that detachment that goes to people's hearts. And so that was his approach to discussing difficult issues. It is something that we can all learn from. I mean, none of us, there's no shortage of confrontational situations, all of us in our lives, either at work or within the family or with the neighbors or anywhere. Now, in all those situations, if you can remember to be, to, take the animus out of it and to basically state a position, that is something that we can learn from the example of Andashim Swamiji. The second thing was that despite the fact that there were great obstacles, they didn't shake his peace. And that was because of his incredibly strong faith in divine protection. The last thing I want to bring up that was known about Andashin Swamiji from a lot of people, and I picked an example from an article that Benigal Sanjeev Mam wrote in 50 Years of Bliss about how Anandashin Swamiji was able to do 
the little things of life with great care and attention. Um, as part of his puja, for instance, one of the things is, is to wash the dandu. That's part of the puja. And it may be, th there are other things in the puja which are of greater importance. This is one relatively minor part of the puja. But the fact that it was relatively minor versus the more important part of the puja didn't make a difference. This was something that Sanjeev Mam noticed who happened to be watching the whole process. That even that, what was the minor part, was done with meticulous care, with great attention. And he, he was not in a hurry. Not that this had to be finished and he had to move on to something else, get it over with. That wasn't there at all. The whole atmosphere was one of calm concentration, doing even the little things of life with great attention. Those are all the things that generate peace. All these ways of approaching life generate peace. One last example I have um, on this issue uh, was Dr. Frank Conlon, who was in Bombay at the time to do research on the history of Vanaps. And uh, in June of 1966, when he was there doing his research, he was lucky enough to get an interview with Andashim Swamiji. And he, um, a couple of years ago, he did mention this in his talk. Um, and he, his, well, his takeaway from that encounter with Antashtan Swamiji was that he was struck by his holiness, which we have already talked about. He, he had this ability to just impact people on first encounter. Um, but he had a presence about it and the calmness that we were talking. So this is something that, that touches everybody who comes into contact with him. Now, when you get to peace, and we take a, a moment to, to think about it. It is hard to define peace. Peace comes from an entire way of life, which we can see with the example of Anandashim Swamiji before us. It's a combination of having vigor and focus and determination, along with serenity and surrender, the divine will. When those two qualities are blended with a good balance, we can be peaceful and still be part of all the duties that are on our shoulders. The second thing is not to be in a hurry. That if there is complete absorption in the work at the moment, when I'm doing this presentation, for instance, to be completely absorbed is to follow the example of Anantash Swami. No matter what you're doing, whether it's minor, or it's major, you're completely absorbed. And the third and last factor which would generate peace in all our lives, again, going back to the example of Anandashtam Swamiji and the entire Guru Parampara, is to have a contemplative discipline in our lives, no matter how busy it is. Those silent hours of prayer and meditation impact our daily life. Swamiji, Anandashim Swamiji was able to distill the essentials and the non-essentials. And this incredible ability or clarity of insight into dharma was, gave him the ability to make changes as needed for a changing world. One important change that happened was the Ratotsav, uh, the festival, the car festival, was suspended because it was absorbing a lot of expenses for the mutt, and the mutt wasn't in a financial position where this would, this would have been, uh, it would have endangered the financial future. So he took the unprecedented step of stopping the car festival or the Ratotsav and substituted it with the Sadhana Sapta, which was a seven day period where there were all these spiritual practices for a whole week Gayatri Jap, Bhajans, Kirtans, Pravachans. Um, it attained the same objective, which is to bring the community into active participation in spiritual practices under the umbrella of the mud, under the protection of the mud. The uh, Ratotsav had the same objective to bring people and draw them into the family, the mud family. Uh, and that was because there, there were other implications of the Tar festival. The Sadhana Sapta was uh, uh, introduced. Now, uh, I bring that up to say that. This is an instance of distilling the essentials 
from the non-essential, focusing on what is the essential meet and objective. The second thing was that uh, Bhanaps were gradually becoming increasingly urbanized. Uh, they were now in the large cities of India, and this was in, in the mid-50s. Now in the 21st century, they were all over the world. But at that point, there was something new that was happening, that it was no longer the cameras. It was now the big cities of India. And you needed some medium to take dharma guidance into the homes of Bhanaps, wherever they were. And so the Chitrapur Sunbeam was launched in the first month of 1954. And I was lucky to get a copy of that very first. Uh, you might not be able to see it because the, uh, the fonts, it, at least on the slides, are not that large. But it says here, January 54, it's volume one, number one. So it's the very first Sunbeam that went out to Bhana Poms. And it was the vehicle or the medium for dharma guidance. That too was an innovation. The essential thing was not sitting in front of an audience and talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, you know, before, like, like used to happen in, in years before, because the community was now a diaspora. Uh, you needed written communication. That was that too was an innovation, distilling the essentials from the non-essentials. And I have some quotes here from the discourses of Anandashim Swamiji, which show once again this power to draw the essentials. Um, he was always very emphatic on the fact that people should not push things beyond their powers. If something is excessive, it is not something that you can do on a consistent basis. You can do it one day, you can do it the second day, and after that you fall back because it's asking too much of you. Um, so everybody has to make the judgment call. And he gave them this, um, that this was something legitimate. They need to do this because whatever they decide is, here are my limits, but I'm going to stay consistent within those limits. So this was a discourse that he gave back in December 1938, um, that dharma should be observed to the best of one's power. So we all have to make the judgment call. Where are those limits? And then keep those unchanged once you decide. Um, I mean, you could always increase it, but uh, it's the consistency and the steadiness that is important. One other point which he emphasized was emphasized as a spiritual practice and also wanted to bring it up as not just something else, meaning there were important spiritual practices and the chanting of the name of God was another one which is, didn't have the same authority. In fact, in this discourse, he um, he quoted Adi Shankaracharya, who had declared on the authority of the Vedas, the Rig Veda, in this, that the repetition of the name or what we call Namaskaran was actually prescribed in the Vedas. And it is simple, but despite being very simple, it is superior to all other spiritual practices. So that was giving the community, life was getting busier and busier. This was one way which had scriptural sanction and scriptural encouragement uh, that, that uh, the, the lady could pick this up and, and run with it, go forward with it. We've seen examples of where there was this distilling between the essentials and non-essentials. But there was also a line beyond which Andhashi Swami did not want to go. And that line was with, with the essential. You can see in this quote, in an address that he gave in 1942, that he said, that if the community asks for reforms that are inconsistent with the essential requirements of dharma, you see, come back to the same principle. We are perfectly prepared to ask them, relieve us of this responsibility of being the Madhavi. So therefore, it reinforced the fact that, yes, we are making modifications, to suit a changing world, there's some things that cannot be modified. And there was no going back at that point on these issues and on these dharma issues. I've shared the stories of the life of Andashan Swamiji. I'm now at the point in the presentation where I want to focus a little bit on what is ahead of us. The main essential is that we need to strengthen our connection to the Guru and the Mutt. 
and there are ways to do it. One way is to use the technology that is available to all of us. It's never been there before, but we are in, in one sense, we are in the luckiest age because we can stay in New Zealand or be in Seattle or anywhere in the world, and we can still be remotely in connection with the mud. And, and, and there's a rich source of guidance um, that is there. Uh, so we need to stay connected with the Guru remotely. Uh, and even if you're in India, uh, this remote connection is, is important to stay, to, to watch his discourses, his Ashirvachans on the website, um, and to keep that constant contact, no matter where you live, no matter where your physical presence is. Um, we are very lucky to have an incredibly wonderful Madhadipati because he has in himself, he straddles two worlds. There's the contemporary world with it is very familiar and very conversant with. And there is the world of traditional dharma, which is equally conversant with. So the community is very lucky to have this um, to have this Mothadipati in Chitrapur where they can they can set up a bond right away because if they come from a contemporary background, unconnected to the mud, unconnected to dharma, or at least if not unconnected. Uh, loosely connected. So it is our good luck to have a Swamiji like him and technology which allows us to stay in remote touch. But technology by itself is never going to substitute being in the presence, being in the physical presence. So the second way to strengthen our connection to the Guru and the Guru Parampara and the entire tradition is to make visits to Sri Chitrapur Marth in Shirali. Now, once again, go back to the thing about one's own power. We all need to make that judgment call. How often do we go? How long do we stay when we go there? Uh, but that's, that is something that each, each family would decide for themselves. But it is important to keep that physical presence uh, and, and physical connection going. Lastly, to keep that connection going at this point, we need to have to study groups wherever you are in the world, within India or outside of India, where you can sit down and discuss and make a serious study of the Shastras. And we have access to the Guru's discourses. We have access to uh, versions of the Shastras and we have guidance. So what it takes is uh, um, small groups of people who are very keen on learning more. That those three things would allow us to keep in touch with the with the Math and the Guru Parampara and to learn what we can from the guidance that is offered. Deep in our own spiritual practice, and that then begins to impact our daily life. So that's I'm at the end of what I had to share with everybody. So in conclusion. Let us pray silently for a few seconds before we bring this presentation to an end. That the Guru's blessings, guidance, and protection be with us always. Over to you, Jaitan Imam. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you, Sai Imam, for your wonderful presentation. Truly, you took us back to the glorious days of the Samaja, basking in the glory of the Anugraha of Parma Puja Srimad Ananda Shum Samiji. I'm sure your presentation would have brought back fond memories, especially among the elders in our Samaj. Thank you once again. With this, we conclude with the Sabha Samapti Prarthana. Om Nandantu Sadaka Sarve Vinashantu Vidushakaha Avastha Shambhavi Mestu Prasanna Ustu Guru Sada Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha 
सर्वे भद्राणी पश्यंत मां कश्चि दुख मुयात ओम शांति 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 ओ नमः पार्वती पतये हर हर महादेव